Man, it's good to see you guys this morning. I did my little quiet hour right here, Hill, and uh, stunning, stunning. Turned my phone off and just sat and listened. So I want to do something. I want you to participate with me as we begin. And before we close, uh, I'll tell you some significance of this tree and this area that I think will inspire you. But you're going to have to help me by participating. So let's do something. We can just kind of be quiet. And then I'm going to ask you in just a moment to take a deep breath and excel audibly. I want to be able to hear it. And then we'll do it three times. And I'll lead us. So prepare for the big breath and an audible exhale. You ready? Let's begin. Let's do it again. A final time. You've just pronounced the name of God. I finished an eight volume commentary on Isaiah from the original Hebrew. My co-writer is Dr. David Darnell. He's a Hebrew scholar, Dead Sea Scroll scholar. The name for God is in Hebrew, the letter Yod, Hey, R H, Vav, R W, Hey. Four letters. It's called the Tetragrammaton. No vowels, only consonants. And in Hebrew, pronunciation is like breath. Now, in English, in your Bible, since you don't read Hebrew, it is translated with four English letters, and they're in all capitals. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Lord. So when you read your Bible and you come across Lord in all caps, in the Hebrew original, it is Now, some theologians have taken yod He vav He and they have added vowels and anglicized it for Jehovah. But I'm telling you, this unpronounceable name, this sacred name, is the name of the Creator, the name of God. In English, Jeff, I think we make a mistake. We think the word Lord is a title, like Lord of the Rings. And so when we read the Bible, we come across the Lord's name, and we think, oh, he's distant, he's a king, he's a lord, I can't know him, I'm a peasant, I'm a servant. But when you begin to understand every time you come across Lord in your Bible in all caps, think of your breath. Let me show you something. If you have a Bible, and if you don't, don't worry, because I'll be quoting, turn to Psalm 150, Turn to Psalm 150, the last chapter of the book of Psalms, and the last verse of this chapter. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version, but your version, whether it's King James or NIV, if you were given an NIV Bible, 
which by the way, I just have to say a word about Jim and Brittany. I, I called my wife late last night. Um, she wanted to know what I thought about this event. And I said, you know, honey, you convinced me to go. And I had high expectations, but my expectations have been exceeded. She said, why? I said, every single detail. These folks not only watch over, it's, it's excellent. And you know, I said the facilities, the food, the care, but it's done, Jeff, in a relational way. A lot of times I'm around excellence and, and there's, no, there's no humility, there's no relationship, but it, it, it's just phenomenal. So in your Bible, which you were given, Look at this last verse of Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now that ought to have new meaning to you. Basically what the scripture is saying is this. When you take a silent hour and you breathe, you're praising your Creator. You're giving His name with your breath. Think about this. When a baby is born, the Lord is praised. Throughout life, when a dog that has breath breathes, the Lord is praised. The Creator is praised through our breath. By the way, I don't think it's an accident that the Son of God died on a tree and breathed His last breath. In fact, this is the language of the Gospels. And He breathed His last. The Son of God breathed His last that we might breathe forever. And the confirmation that the Savior died in the place of people who should die is that He rose three days later, that we might have life, that we might have breath. Now let me show you this tree. You're going to have to take my word for it. Typically, uh, when I teach, I try to give visuals, and uh, we don't have those. So, I'll, yeah, we have the tree. We, ha we have the tree. If we were a little bit further back, it would be stunning. But if you can, focus in on just a portion, and I think you'll get the picture. Why are people compared to trees in the Bible? I love this ranch because it's almost as if Jeff has named every tree. Why are people compared to trees? Focus in on the branches. My wife, who I told you last night has her doctorate in nursing, she and I have talked about this quite a bit. COVID has knocked the breath out of this nation. People are compared to trees because there's a symbiotic relationship between a tree and a person. Your lung under x-rays look exactly like these branches. The bronchial tubes of your lungs are like this Victor's tree. If we were to dig underneath and see the roots, you would see that this tree branches out on top and this tree branches out below. And think about this now. There are 3.1 trillion trees in the world. 444 trees for every person. When you breathe, you're taking in oxygen that has been given off by the bronchial tube branches and leaves of these trees. 
when you breathe out, you're breathing out carbon dioxide, CO2, that these trees need to live on. In fact, I have to say, I hope there's no environmentalist here who will be offended. But this is basic science. Plants do better with more carbon dioxide, not less. <laughs> you can go to YouTube and you can watch. You see, our problem is not we've got too much carbon dioxide. We've been sold a lie. Our problem is we're not planting enough trees. Just think about that, okay? So 444 trees for every human being. It's amazing. NASA has given a picture. You can Google it. You can see the earth breathing in June when leaves come out in the northern hemisphere. You can actually see it from the satellites. There's a symbiotic relationship between trees and human beings. We breathe out, they breathe in. They breathe out, we breathe in. Let everything that has breath praise. Now, that's all introduction. <laughs> some of you, I love the transparency of this group. I heard some of these stories last night. Good night. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, somebody transparently said last night, I don't know the Bible. I love that. I love somebody who says, man, I, 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 I don't know the Bible. Because you'll never begin to know the Bible until you come to the recognition that you don't know it. That's, that's great. It's truth. Well, I've spent my life studying the Bible and I love it I love the Word of God but Jim my job is to take what is seemingly incomprehensible to most people and make it simple so that people will say oh my goodness how come I didn't see that when they read the Bible so I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to ask this one question. You don't have to respond. I just want you to think about it in your mind. If someone were to come up to you and say, tell me, tell me, Jim, tell me, Bill, tell me, Hill, what is the theme of the Bible? What would you say? Now, typically, a believer in Jesus Christ will respond, well, Jesus is the theme. And by the way, I do agree with that. But the problem is, his name is not mentioned in the Hebrew Scriptures. Therefore, a Jew would disagree with you. In fact, we go to Israel all the time, and it's a really cool story, Jim. A couple of paratroopers guide with me, and about 15 years ago, I was sharing Christ with this Jewish Israeli paratrooper, a hero for his nation. And he said to me, he said, wait, I don't understand you Christians. You, you talk about worshiping Jesus, but in my scriptures, meaning the Hebrew scriptures, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You're worshiping a cursed man. And then two years ago, we're in the garden of Gethsemane and I'm reading about Jesus praying the night before his crucifixion and he interrupts me and he says can I read that I said sure he begins reading about halfway through I stop him I said Uval what has happened to you he said what do you mean I said Uval you're reading this as if you believe it he said I do because I see he who was cursed on the tree was cursed for me. You see, you never come to understand the Hebrew Scriptures and all the symbolism and typology until the Holy Spirit first does a work within your heart and mind to open your eyes to the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus is there. 
just hidden and concealed and revealed in the New Testament Scriptures. So if someone were to ask you, what is the theme of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? What would you say? Let me give you what I believe to be the theme. It's real simple. God knocks down the proud and He raises up the humble. Beginning in Genesis 3 with Cain killing Abel because Cain was proud of his offering and hated his own brother. Going through the entire Old Testament to Proverbs, these six things says that I hate. Yea, seven are an abomination in my sight. Pride, number one. Going all the way through the Old Testament prophetical scriptures into the teachings of Jesus where He talks about God will exalt the humble and He will bring down the proud. All the way through in the Bible, the theme is this. Don't Trust yourself. Trust trust Him, not yourself. Let me define pride for you and humility. Pride is thinking too much of yourself. And humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Let me say that again. Pride is thinking too much of yourself. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. In other words, you wake up in the morning and humility is, I breathe. Thank you, Lord. It's going through work, just showing up, breathing, like Matt said. Thank you, Lord. If I live, I live for Him. If I die, it is to my gain. Thank you, Lord. But here's what happens. Over time, we think less of the Lord and more of ourselves. We become a tall tree. And Yahweh always brings down the tall tree. Now let me show you this. Daniel chapter 4. I'm going to show it to you personally, and then we'll end up talking about it nationally, how the Lord does it. Daniel chapter 4. This is going to be truly a Bible study. So we're going to go through this entire chapter. And I realize if you don't have much of a background on Daniel, um, it's sometimes like a fire hydrant. So I'll I'll go slow um, in giving you facts, but you've got to have some background to understand that this is a real event. These things we're about to read actually occurred. They're written about in history books. And the primary subject of Daniel 4, two people. Daniel, the prophet, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Now, Babylon is what we would call today Iraq or Iran. And... One of my favorite stories, uh, Jeff, is, um, you know, similar to Jim and his wife. I received a flag in the mail, and it was a a group of pilots during Gulf War I, after the war. They were in the palace of Saddam Hussein, and they were in his bedroom, and they had set up a television on boxes, and they watched the services from a manual. And they sent me the flag that was flying over his palace. And it's, it's hanging in my office. And that palace was where Nebuchadnezzar had the dream we're about to talk about. Because Saddam Hussein 
believed he was the reincarnated Nebuchadnezzar. And so he was excavating this palace which had been destroyed, rebuilding his on top of the ex excavations, and he wanted to rule the world like Nebuchadnezzar. So let me tell you about these two men before we read the entire chapter and I point out the theme of the Bible in Nebuchadnezzar 4. Daniel was born in 625 B.C. You're like, why do I care about that? Well, you need to understand... He lived, he was born 625 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, before the Messiah came in flesh. He was a prince in Jerusalem, the capital city of Jerusalem, which was the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. He was taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. When Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem, and basically said, okay, you guys owe us taxes now. And by the way, we want to take your princes back to Babylon. And we want your princes to be my servants in my palace. Daniel and his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now these are their Babylonian names. Went to Babylon to be the servants for the king. They were castrated because in ancient days... You couldn't give a bath to the queen and you couldn't be around the daughters of the king unless you were castrated. This is why you don't read of Daniel's wife or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's wives and so on because they were castrated to serve the wicked king Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 1, these four Hebrew boys were offered wine and meat in the king's palace, but they refused. They refused because had given them dietary restrictions. And they said to the servant of Nebuchadnezzar, who was their Lord watching over them, we will not eat. We will eat what has told us to eat. The servant said, do you not care about me? I'll lose my head when you come in weaker and not as intelligent as the other princes from the other countries that Nebuchadnezzar has conquered. He will kill me because I haven't done my job. Are you with me? They obeyed the Lord and said, trust us. Trust us. We're going to obey Yahweh. And when the year was over, they come in stronger, more intelligent, wiser. And Daniel was even given the gift by Yahweh for his obedience to be able to interpret dreams. By the way, here's the application. When the world tells you to do something, fudge that number. Everybody does it. Your report's got to go in and you've got to have a little bit more than what you've got. And don't worry about it. You obey Yahweh and tell the truth. In the end, you will prosper in ways you never imagined. Remember that. You come to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel is promoted and because of his promotion and his ability to interpret dreams he interprets the first dream which is just incredible the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has he interprets it we don't have time to get into it but Daniel basically tells the king oh king your kingdom is going to come to an end and after you there's going to rise another kingdom a kingdom that will come from Persia then after that there'll be a kingdom of Greece and then of Rome by the way this prophecy in Daniel 2 of the coming kingdoms after the kingdom of Babylon falls was given to Daniel hundreds of years before Rome and Greece even existed and for centuries after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ scoffers scoffed at the Bible and said Daniel didn't write Daniel there's no way anybody could have known Rome existed before Rome existed Greece existed before Greece existed no way, no way they mocked it, and they said that a man after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, an imposter, took the name Daniel, and he wrote the book of Daniel after all these kingdoms came and went. But that theory was absolutely destroyed in 1948 when a little shepherd boy threw a rock into a cave 
and the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And scientific testing showed that sure enough, these scrolls, including an entire scroll of Daniel, was hundreds and hundreds of years older than anybody ever could have imagined. You see, it is not impossible for to know the future because he's outside of time. And this is why I tell people who really struggle with giving their life to Christ, they say there's so many religions. Well, listen, there's only one that even attempts to tell you what the future will be. And that's Christianity, the Hebrew Scriptures, and they nail it. Okay, so Daniel 3. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel's promoted. He's now gone. He's not in Babylon. He's in another province. But his buddies are there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue and he orders everybody to bow down. It's a statue of him. And by the way, emperor worship, king's worship, all the ancients, they did this. The king was one of the gods. And so he ordered everybody to bow down. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to bow down to you. And, and so here comes Nebuchadnezzar when he hears about it. And, and he says, look, if you don't bow down, we're going to make a cowboy fire and we're going to put you in it and you're going to lose your life. We're going to kill you. And they said, listen, you can read it for yourself. They said to the king, O king, whom we serve is able to rescue us. But even if he does not, we will not bow down to you. The Bible says, King Nebuchadnezzar was so angry, he ordered his valiant soldiers to take these three friends of Daniel, throw them into the furnace, and the valiant soldiers died when they opened the door to throw them in. They died because of the heat. It was seven times hotter. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are inside this fiery pit, and Nebuchadnezzar is outside, and he looks in and he says, wait a minute, didn't we throw three men in? I see four. And of course, we would say that fourth is the pre-incarnate Savior. It's Jesus before He was born in Bethlehem. And here's the application. Anytime you stand for what is right and follow Christ, even when the world comes after you and threatens you with death, the Lord Jesus will be right beside you in the midst of your fire. Now we come to Daniel 4. Nebuchadnezzar is saved. He comes to faith in and Daniel 4 is his personal testimony. It's similar to what I heard from Corey last night. Daniel tells how he came to trust and before we read the chapter, let me just say to you, if you've got somebody who's been addicted to meth, if you've got somebody who is wicked, if you've got somebody who's done horrible things in his life, you know, when Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem three times, 605, 597 when he captured Ezekiel, 586 when he destroyed Jerusalem and he took everybody captive, it's called the Babylonian exile. Last time in 586, you know what he did to King Zedekiah, the king of Judah? He brought him out to a field like this. And Nebuchadnezzar is standing there and he ordered the sons of Zedekiah to be brought. And Nebuchadnezzar took a gouge. He took a gouge and he stood beside King Zedekiah who had refused to pay taxes to Babylon. And then he ordered his men to kill every one of his sons from oldest to youngest. And the last thing Zedekiah saw was his own sons dying. You read this in the last chapter of Chronicles. And then Nebuchadnezzar takes a gouge and gouges out the eyes of Zedekiah puts him in bonds, and drags him to Babylon. This is the man that is saved in Daniel 4. I tell people all the time, you may have been convicted of rape, you may have been convicted of murder, you may have cheated on your wife, but I'm telling you, God is a God of grace, and He can save the most wicked person. Let's begin. Verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. Do you see? This is first person. 
he is talking about himself. It seems good to me to declare to you what the Most High God, Adonai, the Most High God has done for me, Yahweh. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom, not my kingdom, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion, not mine, his dominion is from generation to generation. How could Nebuchadnezzar say this? How could he say this? How could he come to this place where he is trusting and not himself? Here's how. Verse 4. This is his testimony. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house, flourishing in my palace, and I saw a dream, and it made me fearful. And these fantasies, as I lay on my bed and the visions in my mind, they kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon. These are Chaldean magicians, his men. I ordered that they be brought in that they might know or make known to me the interpretation of the dream. So I brought in the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, the diviners, they came in. And I related the dream that I had to them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. Finally, Daniel, who is like God, is the meaning of Daniel's name, came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians. Since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream which I have seen along with its interpretation. Now, before I tell you what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed, let me say a word about Daniel. He's been promoted, and you read later on after he interprets this vision, Nebuchadnezzar makes him the chief magi. What is a magi? A magician? Well, think about Christmas. When Jesus was born, behold, magi from the east came asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Do you know that Daniel started a school of the Magi in Babylon? When Cyrus, king of Persia, conquered Babylon in 539, October 539 B.C., Daniel chose not to go back to Judah. He died in Iraq. He's buried in Iran. This school of the Magi, he taught the men that he trained that there was coming a Messiah. His scroll was used. Jeremiah's scroll was used. The Magi came to Bethlehem because Daniel predicted in Daniel 7 and Daniel 9 when the Messiah would be born. So the Magi come asking, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? The Magi are those who look at the world and are able to tell you events that are coming. The Chaldean Magi could not. Here comes Daniel, servant of Listen to the dream. Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, As I was laying on my bed, I saw a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong, and its height reached to the sky, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, its fruit abundant. It was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the sky dwelt in its branches, and all living creatures fed themselves from it. And as I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed, behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. And he shouted out and spoke as follows. Chop down the tree. Cut off its branches. Strip off its foliage, scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a brand of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field. Notice the change now in pronouns. Let him be drenched with dew of heaven. Let him share with the beasts in the grass of the field. Let his mind be changed from that of a man. Let a beast mind be given to him and let seven periods of time pass over him. Do you notice how it's first a tree, now it's changed to him. 
In the Bible, trees are compared to people. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight shall be in the instruction that comes from. And in his instruction does he live both day and night. He shall be like a tree planted beside living waters. Nebuchadnezzar is this tree that is about to be cut down. The angel said, This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones. In order, in order that this is happening, in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows power, kingdoms, rulership on whom He wishes and sets it. Notice this, this is key sets over it the lowliest of men. Humble men are set over kingdoms. Proud men are brought down. This is the dream, Nebuchadnezzar said, that I have seen. Now, Belshazzar, please. Belshazzar, by the way, is Daniel's Babylonian name. Please interpret it for me. Here we go. Verse 19. Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him he was appalled at the dream and the king responded and said Belshazzar do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm me tell me Belshazzar Daniel said my lord if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries but the tree applies to you verse 20 the tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful, its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king. You are the tree. You have become great. You have become strong. Your majesty has become great and reached to the sky, your dominion to the end of the earth. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one descending from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree, destroy it, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field, and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time have passed over. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of Yahweh, which has come to you, my Lord. My earthly king, you will be driven away from mankind. Your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like the cattle, be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever He wishes. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules, not you. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. Now, before we finish this chapter, let me just say a word. Have you ever sat in church and listened to somebody preach what the Lord is saying and leave unaffected. Nebuchadnezzar heard Daniel say this and it didn't affect him. A full year goes by. Verse 28. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of his palace of Babylon. By the way, if you ever go to the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, and Hill's probably been there. You see the walls of Babylon. They've excavated them. They're, they're extraordinary. They're beautiful. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the great ancient wonders of the world, the walls of Babylon. You could drive two chariots side by side around them, and we can still see them. He's on these walls at his palace. Look what he says, verse 30. Is this not Babylon the Great? which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty. By the way, let me do a targum. Is this not my Northwest Mutual Kingdom that I have built with my hands 
that I have done by my wise recruiting. Is this not my kingdom? While the word was in his mouth, a voice from heaven came saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. You will be driven away from mankind. Your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind. He began eating grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven. His hair grew so long it looked like eagle's feathers, and his nails grew so long they looked like bird's claws. But at the end of that seven period time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. And this is what He said. His dominion is an everlasting kingdom. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But He does according to His will among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can ward off His hand or say to Him, What have you done to me? At that time my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me. For the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my power, and surpassing greatness was added to me. But now, listen to me, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I close. With two illustrations that I hope you'll never forget. One is personal, and one is national. In 1793, a young man was born in eastern Tennessee. When he was eight years old, his father died. His mother raised him as a single mom. His name was Sam Houston. He ran away when he was 13 to live among the Cherokees in Tennessee for he fell in love with Native American culture. He eventually came back, started a school to pay off his debts. When he was a young man, he ran for Congress, was elected a congressman from Tennessee. When he was 27, he became governor of Tennessee. At 29 years of age, he married a young woman while living in Nashville. Three months after he married her, she left him. This is 1829. When your marriage ends because your wife leaves you, it's not like today when people say, oh, what's the big deal, get married again. Your life comes to an end. He resigned the governorship. Rumors were throughout Tennessee. Sam Houston. He's a drunkard, he's a wife beater, he's an adulterer. In reality, his young wife loved another man. She left him, he lost his governorship, resigned in humiliation. Do you know where he went? He went to Oklahoma. Back then it was called Indian Territory. And he lived among the Cherokees that he had met in Tennessee since he had met them as a teenager. They had been relocated to Oklahoma by the president in what is called the Trail of Tears. In Muskogee, Oklahoma, wasn't a city then, there was a fort, Fort Gibson. He established a trading center and a wigwam. And he fell in love with a young Cherokee woman by the name of Talahina. But he wouldn't marry her because his heart was broken and crushed. 
He lived there for four years, 1829 to 1833. Very little is known about his time during those years. But he loved the Cherokee. The northern part of Mexico was opened up in the early 1830s. And Sam Houston decided to leave the Cherokees and come to the northern part of Mexico. And here in this land, he became friends with Travis and with Austin and with others. He knew the ways of the land. He knew the ways of the Indians. He knew their languages. And they loved Houston because he was genuinely a leader and they were shocked that he had been a congressman and a governor from Tennessee. At a young age, he'd grown into a big tree. And the Lord allowed Sam Houston to be humbled. He cut him down. Until the day of his death, he never spoke about his first wife never said a negative word about her but the fact that she left him broke him while here in texas because of his past experiences and because he had been humbled he began to trust the lord now it was a process it didn't happen overnight but if you read his diaries and letters that he would send he ended up he ended up meeting a woman from Alabama. He had left his Indian girlfriend back in uh, Oklahoma. She's buried at Fort Gibson National Cemetery. There's a city named Tallahena named after her. He left her back there. He met this Alabama woman from Marion, Alabama here in Texas. And she was a Christian woman. She was a Baptist. And she began to talk to him about the Lord. And you know, Sam Houston, there was nothing he could say in response because he understood what it meant to have an empire, a kingdom on his own, and what it meant to be broken by the power of God. And so he listened to her. Now he loved his booze, he, he loved to drink, he, he would cuss quite a bit, but you know what, he listened to his Christian wife. He went on, as you know, to become a leader, stayed here at this cabin over here twice with the Elliots in 1853. The leader that he became in Texas, if you don't know, he was, of course, a general for the army, defeating Santa Ana. He was a man who went on to become the first president of the Republic of Texas. And then when Texas joined the Union nine years later, he became um, the governor of Texas. Then he served as a senator from Texas. And then when the Civil War started in his old age, while he was again governor of Texas, he said, you know what? We're not going to have Texas join the South. I can't do that. And he had to resign because he was overruled and Texas became a part of the Confederate States. And he died in Huntsville in 1863, right after the Battle of Vicksburg. But what I want to tell you about is what happened to him when he was 61 years old. Not far from here in a little creek, he had begun attending church, reading the Bible, understanding that if he had any power, any real power, it always comes from God. So if you look at Sam Houston in Tennessee, compare him to Texas. In Tennessee, it was his kingdom, his power, his majesty, his might. You look at him in Texas, it was all the Lord's doing. It was all the Lord exalting him. It was all trusting in the Lord. And you know what? He was a man of integrity and principle, even though he still had those, those, those rough character qualities about him. When he was 61 years old, he decided he would make public his faith in Jesus Christ. And so my forefather, Rufus Burleson, took him to a creek. Rufus was the pastor of Independence Baptist Church. He had helped found a new school in Independence, Texas, that eventually became known as Baylor University. He was the first one to offer women education. Uh, he moved it to Waco, Texas, and it became, of course, Baylor. He served as president of Baylor U University on two different occasions. Uh, his cousin, Edward Burleson, was a good friend of Sam Houston. That's why the Burleson name is all over, but it's a really cool story. I have a, I have a picture, a painting of this. Photography had just been invented. But Sam Houston is in the creek 61 years old and God has exalted him again but he's not taking credit and my forefather when he baptizes him 
takes him down into the river and pulls him out and says these words, Sam, your sins have been washed away. And Sam Houston responded, God saved the fishes downstream. Why do I tell you that story? Humble people that God exalts are not perfect people. Humble people that God exalts are people who wake up every day By the way, when you feel wind blowing, the breath of God. Ruach in Hebrew is breath. Numa in Greek is breath. My challenge to you today, and you know what? I wasn't planning on speaking this long, uh, but you've listened. I haven't lost you. The challenge that I give to you this day is simply this. When proud people think their kingdom is their own, God always brings it down. And when humble people realize that anything we have is from, He always exalts. The national illustration, and I'm done, Jim, thanks for the time. The national illustration is this. Ezekiel was a friend of Daniel. And Ezekiel was taken into captivity a little bit later, 597 B.C. And Ezekiel is called to be a prophet when he's a young man in Babylon. And there are, there are Jews who've been taken there. So he's to prophesy. He's to talk to his own people. And guys, here's what he did. God told him to take a soft brick of clay and to outline the capital city of Jerusalem in it. You can read this in Ezekiel 5. I'm going to tell it to you quickly. The city of Jerusalem, if you've ever been there, it's easily identifiable by the three valleys. And he was to draw it out, and then he was to play act. He was to lie on his right side for 390 days and lie on his left side for 40 days, a total of over a year. And he was to put a skillet between the brick and himself, and he was to proclaim to the people as they walked down the streets of Babylon, God's face cannot be seen by our capital city because you have rebelled against ordinances. I call it natural law. Look at nature. Do you ever see a bird kill its kids? How in the fat do human beings kill their kids? Look at nature. Do you ever see two homosexuals procreating? How in the fat do we think homosexuality is normal? By the way, I have homosexual friends, but I am not ashamed to say homosexuality is a violation of the ordinances. Of In other words, if you struggle with it, you can still be saved, but you don't celebrate it. So you've got Israel who's violating the laws of nature and of nature's God, and the skillet represents the face of God being hidden. And here's this this prophet who is preaching for a year and a half. And, you know, it's like the crazy guys. You say, it, 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 it's, it's like, maybe if I ever get to Washington, it's what they're going to say of me. Who is this crazy guy from Oklahoma? His hair grew long. Ezekiel's hair grew long. And then, when it was all over, Yahweh told Ezekiel to take a sword and to sharpen it like a razor to cut his beard and to cut his hair. And this bald man now stood on the street and he had scales, the old fashioned scales that you weigh things out. And he was to measure out his hair, a third, a third, a third. And this is what he did. A third of the hair he put in the center of the city and he set it on fire. A third of the hair, you can read this in Ezekiel 5, he threw to the wind and it was scattered. And a third of the hair, he took a sword and he chopped it up. Now watch this. Then Yahweh, said to Ezekiel, say to the people this, because of your rebellion as a nation against my ordinances, one third of you will die by famine in the city. One third of you will buy, die by war. The sword of Nebuchadnezzar 
one third of you will be scattered to the winds. And the remnant, the hair that was left over, put in the hem of your garment, Ezekiel. This will be a picture of the remnant that God has when all this is done. These people will know that I am Lord. All the trees of the field will know that I am the Most High. You see, and I close, throughout the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, when a nation rebels against Yahweh, three things happen. War, famine, pandemic, disease. These are like a sword in the hand of the Lord. If you say that today, people will mock you like they mocked Ezekiel. You know what they did to Ezekiel? They were so angry with him, they killed him. This is why Jesus said, a prophet is not welcome in his hometown. I'm saying in closing, our nation has turned from the Lord. And if we are going to be brought down, it is only that the humble remnant that remains will be rebuilt into a nation that trusts. So when you see war on the horizon and the black swan event of a food famine, which will be next fall, when you see another pandemic that arises, you understand this is not an accident. We're not in control. Yahweh is chopping down tall trees.